Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 342. Today's big Bible questions, what is the world going to be like when Jesus returns, and what command of Jesus made the disciples realize they need more faith? Well, hello, friends. Happy Thursday. Today's title is the longest title in the history of this or any other podcast, I'm quite sure. So my apologies for making you sit through such a verbose title. Today we will be reading 2 Chronicles 2, Nahum chapter 1, Luke 17, and 1 John chapter 2. And our focus passage for both of our Bible questions is in Luke 17. So in this passage, Jesus gives the disciples a challenging teaching. In fact, and it appears that this teaching is so challenging and so daunting that the response is a very simple plea for more faith because they realize they really can't do it. That will be the focus of our first question. Our second question happens a little bit further down in the passage where Jesus gives a pretty expansive description of what the world will be like when he returns. So let's go ahead and read Luke 17 now and pay attention for the challenging command of Jesus. It's early on. And then his description of the world that he will return to. Luke chapter 17, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible He said to his disciples, Offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and if he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Which one of you, having a servant tending sheep or plowing, will say to him when he comes in from the field, come in once and sit down to eat? Instead, will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat, get ready and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you can eat and drink." Does he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, We are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. While traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he told them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And while they were going, they were cleansed. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he told him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, See here or there, for you see the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he told the disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. They will say to you, See there or see here. Don't follow or run after them, for as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But first it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same it was in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be that like that on that day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day a man on the housetop whose belongings are in the house must not come down to get them. Likewise the man who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night two will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked him. And he said to them, where the corpse is, there also the vultures will be gathered. So notice there, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. This sounds like a pretty desperate cry, right? And we see in verses 3 through 4 what provoked such a request from them. They say, It says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, 
You must forgive him. So put yourself in this position. Somebody does something hurtful against you seven times in one day. You and I, unless we have the patience of Job, are probably going to be really upset. That's a lot of times to sin against somebody and hurt them in one day. So what does Jesus say? He says, if someone sins against you and come back, comes back and says, I repent, which the word means to turn away from sin, as we've talked about, and then keeps repeating that sin, Jesus says we still must forgive them. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't help but notice the almost oxymoron in this passage, and I guarantee you that it's in there intentionally. To repent means to turn away from something and do something else. If you're sinning and repenting seven times in a day, then you're not genuinely repenting the first six times. It's probably flippant, shallow, unmeant, and careless to say the least. And what does Jesus say for us to do when confronted by such meaningless and false repentance, or at least at the very best temporary repentance? What does Jesus say? He says we must forgive. How challenging! And the disciples immediately understood and knew how challenging it was because they quickly cried out for more faith. They knew that is a very hard command. Why would Jesus command his disciples to do this? Because honestly, you and I, we've done the same sort of thing to God many times. We've asked forgiveness and turned around and did the same thing again and again and again and asked for forgiveness again. And God is faithful to forgive. Forgiving others is absolutely crucial, according to Jesus, because he teaches us this challenging truth in the Sermon on the Mount. If you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. That's Matthew 6, 14 and 15. So figure forgiveness of others is absolutely crucial, essential, central. If we don't, then it as is as if we aren't recognizing that we ourselves are sinners and in great need of grace. So Jesus tells us a wonderful parable about this dynamic, and by wonderful, I suppose I mean challenging. Then Peter approached Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times must my I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, said Jesus, but seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, and his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him and forgave the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servants fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that happened. Then after he summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant like I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. So that's one of those parables that honestly is pretty pretty crystal clear to understand. It barely needs any commentary. Jesus is very, very, very clear that the Father forgiving the massive volumes of our sin debt is a much, much bigger deal than us forgiving a very small sin debt of somebody else towards us. Now, is forgiveness hard? It absolutely is, and thus the cry of the disciples for more faith. But we must remember, we have been forgiven, and we don't want to be like the wicked servant who is forgiven this unpayable debt and then goes out and crushes and sends somebody else to jail for a comparatively small debt. One book I can recommend to you if you are struggling with forgiveness in any sort of way, um, maybe you have a particularly painful wound or something like that, is Total Forgiveness by Dr. R.T. Kendall. 
K-E-N-D-A-L-L, R.T. Kindle. It's a fantastic book, and I've actually had the privilege, it's been a few years now, but I've had the privilege of spending some time, uh, two different occasions with Dr. Kindle before. And I've found him to be an amazing, godly, humble, and delightful man. And Total Forgiveness is a fantastic book that really unpacks the biblical teaching on how important it is to forgive other people. All right, second topic. What will the world be like during the time immediately prior to the return of Jesus? Well, the Bible answers that question in various ways. Paul notes that there will be terrible times in the last days because people will be selfish and godless. And Jesus here gives us a different perspective on his return. And I don't mean different in that it disagrees. I mean different as in looking at it from a different angle. They both light up, line up. But Luke 17, 24 says, As the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon, lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark and the flood and came and destroyed them all. We learn from that passage that the return of Jesus won't be a secret or a surprise. Over the centuries, like so many people have come forward in their adulthood and claimed to be the second coming of Jesus, but Jesus immediately helps rule out all of those spurious claims by teaching that his return will be obvious, not hidden and unmistakable, not somebody just kind of walking up and saying, oh, by the way, I'm the Messiah, and think crazy like that. Then he tells us that people will be going about their business on the earth, just as unaware of the pending return of Jesus as Sodom was on the day of its destruction, or the people of Noah were unaware during the day the flooding rains began. In other words, life will be going on all around the world, and suddenly, like a flash of lightning, the return of Jesus will happen, surprising people like the visit of a thief in the night. It'll be a pretty routine day in a lot of ways. People will be eating at McDonald's. There'll be weddings happening, maybe football games, people on their couch watching TV or out in the woods for a stroll, and boom, Jesus is returning. Should this return 100% absolutely take the church by surprise? Well, I believe the Bible is very clear that we will not know the day or the hour of the return of Jesus. So yes, the day it happens will definitely be surprising, but... Paul does say this somewhat mysterious thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. And that tells me that this day will not be a total surprise to the people of God who are reading the word, being led by the Spirit, and eagerly awaiting the Master's return. We're not going to be able to divine the date by some hidden code in the Bible, of course. And I don't think we're going to know the exact timing, but according to the passage... Maybe we'll know the season, or at least that the time is drawing near. So I will close with the command of Jesus that we need to focus on as to his return. Luke 21, 34 through 35, Jesus says, Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing drunkenness and worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come on all who live on the face of the earth. So friends, be ready. Let us be ready. We continue with Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1. Solomon decided to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. So he assigned 70,000 men as porters, 80,000 men as stone cutters in the mountains, and 3,600 as supervisors over them. Then Solomon sent word to King Hiram of Tyre, Do for me what you did for my father David. You sent him cedars to build him a house to live in. Now I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God in order to dedicate it to him for burning fragrant incense before him, for displaying the rose of the bread of the presence continuously, and for sacrificing burnt offerings for the morning and the evening, the Sabbaths and the new moons and the appointed festivals of the Lord our God. This is ordained for Israel permanently. The temple that I am building will be great, for our God is greater than any of the gods. But who is able to build a temple for him, since even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him? Who am I then, I should that I should build a temple for him, except as a place to burn incense before him? Therefore send me an artisan, who is skilled in engraving to work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and with purple, crimson, and blue yarn." He will work with the artisans who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, appointed by my father David. Also, send me cedar, cypress, and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants know how to cut the trees of Lebanon. 
Note that my servants will be with your servants to prepare logs for me in abundance, because the temple I am building will be great and wondrous. I will give your servants, the woodcutters who have cut the trees, 120,000 bushels of wheat flour, 120,000 bushels of barley, 120,000 gallons of wine, and 120,000 gallons of oil. Then King Hiram of Tyre wrote a letter and sent it to Solomon. Because the Lord loves his people, he set you over them as king. Hiram also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who made the heavens and the earth. He gave King David a wise son with insight and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. I have now sent Huram Abi, a skillful man who has understanding. He is the son of a woman from the daughters of Dan. His father is a man of Tyre. He knows how to work with gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood, with purple, blue, crimson yarn, and fine linen. He knows how to do all kinds of engraving and to execute any design that may be given him. I have sent him to be with your artisans and the artisans of my lord, your father David. Now let my lord send the wheat, barley, oil, and wine to his servants as promised. We will cut logs from Lebanon as many as you need, and bring them to you as rafts by sea to Joppa. You can then take them up to Jerusalem. Solomon took a census of all the resident alien men in the land of Israel after the census that his father David had conducted, and the total was 150,600. Solomon made 70,000 of them porters, 80,000 stone cutters in the mountains, and 3,600 supervisors to make the people work. Nahum chapter 1 verse 1 The pronouncement concerning Nineveh, the book of the visions of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. The Lord takes vengeance against his foes. He is furious with his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up, and he makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither. Even the flower of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his burning anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Even rocks are scattered before him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. But he will completely destroy Nineveh with an overwhelming flood, and he will chase his enemies in darkness. Whatever you plot against the Lord, he will bring it to complete destruction. Oppression will not rise up a second time, for they will be consumed like entangled thorns, like the drink of a drunkard, and like straw that is fully dry. One has gone out from you who plots evil against the Lord and is a wicked counselor. This is what the Lord says, though they are strong and numerous, they will still be mowed down and he will pass away. Though I have punished you, I will punish you no longer. For now, I will now break off his yoke from you and tear off your shackles. The Lord has issued an order concerning you. There will be no offspring to carry on your name. I will eliminate the carved idol and cast image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave for you are contemptible. Look to the mountains, the feet of the herald who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah. Fulfill your vows, for the wicked one will never again march through you. He will be entirely wiped out. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. This is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because 
The darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, since your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have conquered the evil one. I am writing to you, children, because you have come to know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have come to know the one who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. God's word remains in you, and you have conquered the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one's possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. By this we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I am not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth." Who is the liar, if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Amen and amen. Well, my friends, may the Lord bless you. May his face shine on you. May he give you joy and peace in believing. May you walk in great faith and be blessed. Good day to you and Godspeed.